So we will uh, basically the talk. Uh, the my talk is uh, in two parts. The first is uh, to assess visual equity in children, which itself is a is uh, quite a big talk. Uh, and the second part is to talk about committed strabismus. Uh, I feel uh, a lot would be uh, overlap of what uh, uh, Dr. Murli has already said. So I would uh, basically restrict my talk towards cover test and uh, ocular motility. So we'll start with uh, how to assess visual function in children. Uh, really, uh, really a difficult task when it actually comes to us and when you have to reliably say uh, whether this patient is able to see this much or that much, when you have to quantify it, quantify it, it becomes difficult. So we all know this, that uh, vision is one of the important five senses. Most of the information is processed by vision. Visual function, if you see in totality, it gives you light sense, form sense, color sense. Uh, light sense obviously is the most primitive sense. Um, uh, it is actually the ability to perceive light without any auditory clue. So this is important. When the patient comes to you in the OPD, this is important. You have to show the torchlight, but you don't have to give an auditory clue. ERG, again, is something very similar to giving a flash and uh, uh, you know getting what the photoreceptor response is there. And similar is the flash VEP, which gives you the response from the occipital cortex when you put a flash light. So these are uh, the basic visual milestones which the patient achieve with the which a, which a normal kid achieves uh, so by 30 weeks of gestation um, by 30 weeks of gestation is before the kid is born uh, there is pupillary reaction and he dislikes bright light he closes his lids at birth and uh, within two to three weeks there will be a doll's eye movement because of vor uh, okn is seen four to eight weeks fixation becomes developed See, these are all physiological ranges. We, we do not talk on absolute terms like we talk in Snellen's visual equity where we say that this, pa this patient sees 6.6, 6, this patient sees 6.7.5. So these are, uh, uh, in when, the, when there is growth, when we are talking about milestones, there is always a range. There is no cutoff. Like at four weeks, he should be able to fix it. At four weeks, two days, he will be able to do this. It is not like that. It all depends on how he is growing. So you, you do not label the kid as blind or having poor vision if the kid is not able to see at four weeks. You have to give time. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a rare entity like delayed visual maturation uh, that, is, uh, that won't be covered. But uh, see, first the child would fixate, then there will be social smile, and there would be the, the horizontal movements will come first and vertical movements will follow later. You know, really uh, apprehensive I have seen really apprehensive parents coming to me and saying the kid is not looking up. And then after three weeks, he is, after, after a week or so, he starts looking up. So it is important for you to understand what are the normal milestones. At three months, he would, reaching, he would start reaching out to the interesting objects which he feels are interesting, like bright objects, uh, bright light. At four months, foveal differentiation will be complete. Again, these are all uh, broad, broad ranges. So by six months, uh, stereopsis is there, and VEP visual equity is 6.6. Six. See, the VEP visual equity does not mean Snellen's visual equity. We'll see what is the difference between VEP visual equity and a normal Snellen's visual equity. By 12, to 12 months to 14 months, uh, he will start scribbling with clients. Three years, the vision, visual equity, measurable visual equity, HOTV or recognition, tumbling e-test or uh, illiterate uh, hand chart, that would reach the adult level, which does not mean that the kid is not seeing adult level visual equity at two years. It just means that we are able to measure it on Snellen's chart by three years of age because it, it involves verbal response also. By five years, stereopsis is completely developed, and by 10 years, it is end of critical period. These are some of the pictures taken from books uh, just to show you how the kid mimics his uh, mother's facial expressions. A uh, two-month-old infant is uh, talking uh, to the doll, and uh, you know this is this is eye contact. You can see the pictures. Okay, uh, so when the kid comes to you in the OPD, what are the uh, how should you how should you start? So first of all, you should have a broad idea what are the best time. Uh, f for the kid to, you know, uh, see him because sometimes the kid comes into the OPD and starts crying and that's it. That's end of the examination. You don't do anything. You can't do anything because the kid is crying. You, you, you simply don't have a clue what to do. So you better put that uh, appointment later or you can ask the mother what would be the better time to evaluate the kid. 
second thing is that you know you you can tell the parents what do you expect of the child sometimes we give them a give them a allen preschool chart or a lia symbol chart and we tell them that kid should be told what is expected of him so this cannot be done on the first first appointment and the kid may not respond even on lia symbols the kid may not respond because he doesn't know what is expected of him so when you start on the first visit try to start with both eyes open have little more patience compared to adults just do not you know the moment you occlude one of the eye he he is threatened the kid feels that you are going to do something and so he just resists he just closes both the eyes so start make 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 him comfortable start with both eyes open or start with the eye which you feel is non squinting the fixing eye this changes in the subsequent visits when when you have started patching if the child is amblyopic or he is strabismic and you have started patching on the subsequent visits you have to start with the defective eye first before removing the patch because uh, you know unlike uh, Unlike me or unlike uh, all the setups, people have uh, same Snellens. I mean, we have switched over to computerized visual testing, but uh, same Snellens chart. The kid just sees with his better eye, and he remembers the whole chart. Do not underestimate him. He remembers the whole chart completely, right to left, left to right. If you tell him to read it with the better eye first, and later on tell him to read it with the amblyopic eye, he will. He can read it with his eyes blindfolded. So start with the defective eye first. when on subsequent visits so uh, uh, this has been noted that you will have better responses for 3 meter charts you have to observe head posture as dr murli has told and do avoid uncomfortable occlusions see if the child is resisting don't fight back there is no point in fighting back he has to cooperate if he doesn't cooperate the, the day is over you have to you have to reschedule the appointment you simply cannot examine the kid with he being not cooperative or he being not willing so you carefully watch whether he is peeping above the glass from between the fingers use palm of hand try to test near vision you know if you can if you can try to test near vision uh, this all is already known that uh, linear acuity testing is better than single acuity testing because single acuity testing overestimates the vision because of the crowding phenomena okay this is what i was talking about when i was talking about that the visual acuity is different when you test them with vep and when you test them on snellens chart and this uh, particular uh, table uh, shows you how how these things are different detection resolution and recognition so these are three things and recognition is what we do for adults which means that the child has to recognize it and then tell what exactly it is so this is different from vp this is different from force preferential looking where the kid actually doesn't have to tell anything he just has to look at the chart and we estimate it is it is more objective you can say but then it normally overestimates even vp it would slightly overestimate the vision compared to uh, the recognition uh, charts snellens hotv stikar cambridge these are different charts uh, these are different charts which have been made by different people thinking that they are better uh, in their hand allen preschool lia symbols k picture chart these are, these are all different ways of doing the same thing and this is uh, this is taken from uh, i mean this this has been published this is a published data by teller et al greeting visual acuity uh, again this is only to tell you how how do they estimate visual acuity like if you are seeing a teller acuity card or a keeler acuity card the the strip width that you see minutes of arc the strip width that you see if 1 minute of arc is equal to 30 cycles per degree and snellens acuity is 66 this is all defined this is all given in the books this is a uh, solid data so uh, obviously uh, the the principle is that if you if you have a okn drum if you rotate it and if you see that there is a normal okn which is produced you you know that the kid has a good visual acuity finer stripes if you use finer stripes more finer the stripes better the visual acuity and uh, obviously you can have false positives even in cortical blind uh parietal lobes there will be okn symmetry versus occipital lobe lesion where there there won't be any okn asymmetry so that brings us to uh, another set of uh, tests which are preferential looking tests so basically what is preferential looking test uh, we all know that the kid would like to see towards a pattern more uh, than towards seeing a bland background this is on this these three things work these two are similar keeler's uh, keeler and teller are very similar except that there is a square grating in teller acuity card and a circular grating in uh, keeler acuity card card of acuity cards are vanishing optotypes which means that you know when you when you go beyond a certain distance 
it just vanishes. So this is the Terror Equity card. Uh, you, you, so what what they do is they have a they have a card. They have a card here. You can see it uh, monocularly or binocularly, and the examiner sits behind this particular uh, division, and he watches whether the kid looks at the uh, gratings or looks at the plain background. Okay, uh, this is uh, this is the round one. So this is the keeler. So examiner is hidden behind the screen. We all know uh, this is the theory that homogeneous surface on one side and black and white stripes on the other side. The kid would like to see towards black and white stripes. And the chart which I showed you uh, defines the amount of vision the kid has uh, depending on the cycles per degree and the stripes per centimeter or per division. Finer the stripes, better the visual acuity. And uh, till there is no correlation with the direction of gaze, which means that sometimes it looks at the right, sometimes looks at the left. Uh, so this is uh, these are these are killer killer equity cards. You can do it like this only. This also uh, this was uh, from where I did my fellowship, Arvindai Hospital. Uh, this is an article published uh, in Archives of Ophthalmology, it is an old article, 1995, by Kushner, uh, who said that uh, terror equity cards may underestimate the presence of amblyopia, which basically means that it overestimates the visual equity. Uh, in terms, you know, when you compare tellers with uh, Snellens. So teller equity cards may underestimate. See, it is like, uh, you know, these all visual equity charts and all things are like softwares. There are few limitations and there are few. So normatives are different for different uh, test patterns. So teller equity cards obviously would overestimate the amount of visual equity. And then there is, a, okay, we'll come there to that later. There's an article by Dr. Sharma also in IGO where he has compared teller equity cards with card equity testing. Anyway, we will first see this. Uh, card equity testing, uh, the principle is that the optotype or the the figure, the diagram, will completely fade into the background when the retinal image is not resolved, which means that at a certain distance it would be clear. The moment you go beyond that, it would it would make it invisible rather than blurred. So you can see that there is a there's a small uh, engine made, and then there are different shapes. So one card will have. Uh, on the up and down. There would be an image either on the upper part or on the lower part and we just have to see uh, whether the kid is looking at the image or looking at the, or he is indistinct. He is not looking at any uh, particular thing. The difference is that here you have pictures instead of gratings. So you feel that the kid would be more attracted towards the pictures. And um, so these are the two, th this chart shows you the differences between the grating, uh, I mean, between the Teller Equity Card Keelers and the Cardiff. So here, the, the whereas TAC or the Teller's Equity Card has grating resolution and this has pic pictorial resolution. So crowding is there, there is no crowding. So if there is no crowding, it means that this would again overestimate the vision more than even Teller's. So this is less interesting for the kid, this is more interesting, this is more time consuming, this is quick, this is more precise obviously because it has grating and it has crowding, so it is more precise compared to uh, card equity card. So this is uh, by Dr. Sharma, uh, which was published in 2003, I was talking about this. Uh, so he, uh, he uh, did, uh, did a study on both card equity tests and teller. Uh, under two years of kids and he felt uh, that uh, card equity card is a useful and child friendly test but again what is what is already known is that uh, it may miss some cases of visually significant refractive errors compared to teller equity cards so teller equity cards he said was more precise but card equity card has its own importance and it is more user friendly and uh, child friendly so uh, that brings us back to the original classification of preferential looking preferential forced preferential looking uh, the advantages are that it is relatively inexp inexpensive uh, it is reproducible yes uh, it can be done even for uncooperative kids like uh, mentally uh, mentally slow or challenge kids. Uh, the problems are that it overestimates the vision. So low myopia may be missed because uh, you are seeing it for the near. So low myopia may be missed. Nystagmus is a problem. Large field effects. So if they have large field effect, there will be a problem. Cross fixations, it is difficult. You know, it is really difficult. So you have to cl cl close one of the eyes and then try. And fatigue of patient is another thing because you have to use a lot of cards. The child may get fatigued at the end of the test and you may feel that, you know, he's not, uh, he's not actually looking at it, whereas his visual equity may be good. Now, that brings us to one of the most objective tests, which is visual evoked responses. Uh, this is basically a EEG recording from the occipital lobe in response to the visual stimulus that is presented to the kid. Now, compared to EEG, the, the difference between EEG and VEP is that VEP is specific to occipital lobe, and there are only three 
थ्री इलेक्ट्रोड्स इन अ सिंगल चैनल सेटअप और फाइव इलेक्ट्रोड्स इन अ टू इन अ फोर चैनल सेटअप सो इट इज वेरी स्पेसिफिक ओनली टू दॉस्पिटल हॉस्पिटल कॉटेक्स द एम्पलीट्यूड एम्पलीट्यूड विल टेल यू अबाउट द विजुअल एक्टिविटी एंड लेटेंसी विल टेल यू अबाउट द विजुअल फंक्शन पाथवे फ्लैश विजुअल इवक्ट रिस्पॉन्स कैन ओनली ग्रॉसली टेल यू अबाउट द मैक्यूला एंड द विजुअल पाथवे वेदर इट इज नॉर्मल और नॉट Flash VR does not tell you anything about the visual acuity. Recently, I saw a kid. He was five years old. The kid had undergone flash VEP at one and a half years of age, and was told that his visual acuity is absolutely normal, and there is nothing to be done. The kid actually ended up with a an isometropic amblyopia, and uh, he and they did not have a clue why it happened when flash VEP was normal. So, flash VEP is a very very gross test. It does not tell you anything about visual acuity. so even if the kid is uh, having a poor visual acuity of around 660 flash vp may be normal i said may be it may be normal even if he is a myop it may be normal so pattern reversal vp or checkerboard uh, or stripes pattern whichever pattern but that can tell you something about the visual acuity so pattern vp tells you about visual acuity and flash vp has absolute no role in uh, telling you or estimating visual acuity in the kids under 8 weeks flash vp is of absolutely not much uh, not much uh, role because it may be normal even in cortically blind children which means that the normative vp which you see in a kid under 8 weeks is similar to a kid who is cortically blind which does not mean that it is normal vp is normal in under 8 weeks which only means that under 8 weeks you can't do vp to say what whether the kid is able to see or not and after 8 weeks latency delay may correlate with brain damage and rise in intracranial intracranial pressure but it does not give any clue about the ventricular size so we are basically looking at uh, children with periventricular leukomalacia which is out of uh, course uh, for this particular lecture so this is a handheld uh, you know handheld dome as you as you have a large dome for uh, for adults there is something which is known as a, the curvus field which is a small handheld dome for pediatric kids for children uh, so you sedate them and you can use this dome to do flash pp or flash erg okay the advantages are that it doesn't require any subjective response and it is reproducible but the disadvantage is that okay uh, one thing is that it is uh, expensive another thing is that you really require you know it is you really require a trained person and every lab has its own normative date normatives which are different from other lab moreover you can't do a pattern vp in a small kid less than uh, you know 1 year of uh, age and so you you can do a sweep vp but uh, the sweep vp is uh, not as uh, you know it is very reliable in the hands of people who have written that program but not in the hands of uh, commercially available vps it is not that much reliable and at the end of the day if you are doing only flash vp it is just a light recognition so you are not uh, you are not getting any anything about cognition anything about actual visual acuity so uh, another way of uh, finding out uh, visual acuity is fixation pattern so there are three csm method is what normally is followed so there are three things in csm method central whether the fixation is central or not whether it was steady or not and whether it was maintained or not and how do you how do you actually do that is if, whether the visual fixation is central light reflex is in the center of the pupil or not uniocularly and binocularly whether it is steadiness of fixation on a moving target when you move it whether he moves it with the target or not and whether it is maintained whether the fixing eye Uh, you know when when you cover it whether it is maintained whether whether he is able to maintain the fixation under cover or not uh, with a blink or not so this is uh, this is a classification of uh, how to interpret from uh, csm method how do you interpret in terms of visual acuity of snellens again these are very gross uh, these things and you you really cannot you know go with them completely and so there are already ranges given if there is unsteady central fixation less than 660 which could be anywhere between 2 by 60 to 6 by 60 steady central fixation but it is not maintained there is a range given 660 to 636 or 624 central steady and can maintain but prefers other eye could be anywhere between 612 and 624 central steady maintain cross fixation freely alternating could be between 66 to under 612 or 69 okay these are you know i will be uh, i will be giving a uh, i will be enumerating almost all the methods and so we will go through this very quickly because there are a lot of methods of estimating visual acuity in kids there is a dot visual acuity so there are different size nine black dots on a white background 
being touched from a distance of 25 centimeters and there you can estimate the visual acuity. Then there is cat foot drum. There, there are different size oscillatory black dots on the white drum which are being seen at a distance of 60 meter. There is a marble game where there are different size marbles. Okay, this is, uh, you know, just to tell that when you close the better eye, the kid starts crying. This is a cake decoration which, which comes. <coughs> I'm sorry. So this you can do between 15 to 18 months. You put one in, in his mouth so that he, it's sweet and the kid wants to get another one. So important thing is whether he locates it and picks it up from your palm or whether he searches it on the, you know, whether he searches it on, your, on the surface of the palm and finds it. That tells you whether he is able to see that cake decoration or not. Uh, so one of the most commonly used tests is uh, SG test or Sherindon Gardner test between two to four years. So we will be seeing most of these tests which are actually matching optotypes. So there is SG test, there is Keeler's crowding charts, K picture chart, multiple tests which are based on almost similar principle which are known as matching optotypes where there is a, there is a card with the examiner and there is another matching card with the kid. So there is a flip book with the examiner and he keeps on showing various letters, numbers, pictures and the child has to match uh, as to what he is able to see on that uh, flip uh, book. So there, are <coughs> so there are seven letters, uh, flip cards with seven letters, staccar letters, they are printed individually and they are to be matched on the card. Then there are, there are Cambridge cards, uh, so there, is, there are single, the, the distance is three meters, this is single optotype and this is a crowding card of Cambridge. Then there is HOTV. Uh, so there is, uh, they are reversible on the mirror. That is how it is uh, there, HOTV. But still, uh, you know, when you, uh, you can have a 25% of guessing it correct because there are only four letters. So these are distant charts, near charts. Then there is LIA symbols. Again, there are only four responses. So 25% chance of guessing it correct is there because there are only four responses. Heart, house, circle and um, square. So it, the naming is better than HOTV. You can, uh, the kid can recognize them and tell them it is easier compared to HOTV. But the principle is similar. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll skip that. Okay, these are, uh, these are another ones which are Allen preschool charts. So these are another interesting pictures on there. Nowadays they have, they have got matching cards with this also. So the kid can tell whether he is able to see the car, engine, house, horse. So these are K picture charts, an another way of doing the same thing. And then there are, uh, the Stackard system is basically screening tests for young children and uh, retards. Uh, there is a rolling ball test, matching toy test, matching letter test. So there are matching toys available. And then you, you throw a ball towards them, which is known as the rolling ball test. They are very small balls. If they are able to hold it, it means they are able to see it. So uh, there is a seven millimeter diameter ball for six to nine months. And then there are these small toys which you have to match or you have to point it out whether they are available or not. So letter matching for Stakar is uh, based on, uh, well, it could be circle, square or triangle, three to six meters. These are the letters used for three year old. Then you add some more letters at four years and more than four years you add more letters because you want to reduce the chance of guessing. Then there are uh, Fook symbols, triangle, square, circle, uh, square. Then there is a literate e-test, Jogren's hand test, broken ring. You know, there are, there are innumerable kind of tests. These are uh, various tests which are available. There are heady paddles. These are the heady paddles. Then comes to near visual equity. It is important in amblyops uh, to test near visual equity because it is, uh, some, some people actually believe that near visual equity improves before distance visual equity. This has been re refuted in a PIDIG test, PIDIG uh, studies, but it was uh, believed that near visual equity actually improves before uh, distance visual equity. These are near vision charts for children. Okay, this brings us to this, uh, I always point out in, uh, my lecture because this is normally, you know, when, whenever we talk about stereopsis, we feel that this is something big. This is something big which is going on. There's nothing big. This chart tells you that even if the visual activity decreases, stereopsis doesn't decrease that much. Stereopsis is a binocular thing. You have to test us binocularly. And this visual equity is binocular decrease in visual equity, not monocular. Because if there is monocular decrease in visual equity, obviously the stereopsis will be lost. Because the images will not be symmetrical. There, there may be, you know, if there is an isometropy or an isoconia, you may not have good stereopsis. We are talking about non-amblyopic patients who have less visual equity. Okay, this we will skip. 
Okay, these are again, uh, you know, the the milestones which we talked about. Or uh, okay, this this is uh, the type of uh, test which which they will ask you in exams. Which particular test you would like to take for uh, the kids? So, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, that we just got to the end. How do you go back? That was a little too quick. Okay, so if the kid is, when there is a newborn kid, you want to test his visual acuity, what all things you have to see, pupillary reflex, whether he's able to see the horizontally moving targets, whether a doll's eye movement is present or not, whether the blank reflex or not, does not rule out, uh, I mean, uh, whether he is able to close the light and light, uh, close the lids and light, and OK and with the help of uh, OK and drum. When the kid is between 6 to 12 months, you can again use OK and, you can use preferential looking tests, VEP or VER, you can use a cat foot drum. You can use these things also. You can see his fixation behavior. You can see response to occlusion, whether the kid cries when you close the seemingly fixating eye. You can do a cover test and you can use a, a central study uh, maintained fixation method. One to two years, you can use marble game, small marbles. You have to show it to the kid and if he holds to small, smallest marble, his visual acuity is good. You can use candy test or cake decoration test, as I told you. You can use the Stakar ball test. You can use Worth Ivory ball test. Two to three years, you can use dot visual acuity card, coin test, miniature toy test. Three to five years, this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is more easy at three to five years. You can use illiterate E-test, Jogren's hand test, SG chart, K picture chart, HOTV, Leah symbol, preschool, Allen. All this you can use when the kid is around three to five years. More than five years, of course, when the kid is responding well, you can use your normal Slenin's test. Nystagmus patients, you have to see with or without head posture. You have to use, uh, you have to see monocular versus binocular vision. You have to use near and distance visual equity both. This is another uh, simple, uh, simple tip that, you know, whenever you occlude, if the patient has manifest latent or latent nystagmus, then nystagmus would increase. So you can use a high plus lens, you can use a vectograph slide, you can use duochrome or use a distant occluder, which means that you can keep your occluder a little bit at a distance from the eye and still, uh, you know, make sure that he reads only with one of the eyes. So that brings us to the end of uh, one of the talks. The second talk I would be taking only on... Uh, only on cover test to save time. Cover test gives you almost all the information that you need to, uh, in a committant strabismus or in an incommittent strabismus. Cover test gives you almost everything in a strabismus patient. It, uh, it uh, covers almost everything except the sensory examination and the visual acuity chart. So what does cover test tell you and what is the need of it? Uh, so uh, there are different uh, headings under which we can take cover test. The cover test is, uh, the first part is cover test, cover uncover test, alternate cover test, prism cover test and corneal reflection test. So what does, what, what does it tell you? The cover test tells you the type of deviation. So when you cover the seemingly fixating eye, when, you co when the patient walks into your clinic, you have an idea which eye is squinting and which eye is not squinting. So we will talk first about tropias and then go into phorias. So the, the tropia means that there is a manifest deviation. When the patient walks into your clinic, there is a deviation which you can see. Phoria means the latent deviation. There is no deviation when patient walks into your clinic. And so you have to, do, you have to directly go to the alternate cover test. But first we'll talk about the tropia, the patient who has come to you with a manifest deviation. So what, what, does, what do you do in cover test? The first, first step that you do is you cover the fixing eye, the seemingly fixating eye. When the patient walks into your clinic, what do you do? You cover the seemingly fixating eye. The, the first question which normally a first year would ask is why should we cover the seemingly fixating eye? We can cover any of the eyes. Because you don't want to waste your time. If you cover the non-fixing eye, there is no information that you get out of it. Nothing. Because he is already fixing with the better eye. So if you cover the non-fixing eye, what are you going to gain? Absolutely nothing. So you cover the seemingly fixating eye and watch the response of the eye which was not fixing. 
What does it tell you? It tells you whether the patient has any manifest deviation or not. That is number one. Second thing is it will tell you from where it comes uh, to the center, whether it is coming from in to out, whether it is coming from out to in, whether it is coming from up to down or down to up. So that tells you three things, whether the patient has ESO, EXO, hypo or hyper, whether the patient has tropia or phoria, whether the patient has a unilateral squint or an alternate squint, which, which, is, which comes in the second part, which means once you cover the eye, you see which type of deviation he has, that is number one. Second thing, whether he had a manifest deviation or not. Third thing, whether he had, uh, whether he has poor vision, whether he has fixation problem, whether he has latent nystagmus or not. These are the things which you get from cover test. Then you uncover that thing. Just leave it. You covered one eye and then you uncovered that eye. So what do you get out of it? What would happen if you uncover the seemingly fixating eye? What would happen? Either the eye which was taking, which had taken up the fixation would maintain it or would leave it. These are the only two things that can happen. So what does that tell you? That tells you whether it is a unilateral deviation or an alternate deviation. So if that eye which took up the fixation maintains the fixation, then it is an alternate deviation. And if it leaves fixation, then it is a unilateral deviation. See, never, never confuse alternate cover test with alternate tropia. This is very common. This is not restricted to postgraduates. I, I, I would, you would be surprised when you would start your practice, you would see that, uh, you know, even uh, ophthalmologists would write alternate exophoria. Phoria is bound to be alternate. Alternate exotropia. When the patient has just one eye unilateral squint, why it is important? It is important because if patient has alternate tropia, that patient can be operated because the visual acuity must be good or almost equal in both the eyes. If there is a unilateral squint, there may be a presence of amblyopia. So this is very, very important that you should never do alternate cover test. The moment patient comes to your clinic, you start doing alternate cover test and what do you get? You get alternate tropia, but that is bound to happen because you never did uncover test. If you do an uncover test, only then you can tell whether patient was maintaining fixation with the non-fixing eye or was not maintaining fixation. I hope it is not very, you know, it is not very quick for everybody <laughs> because... Uh, because we do it, so, I mean, we do it very quick, so we, we feel that it is simple, but it may not be very simple for you, uh, you are just beginning. So, the next thing, uh, okay, these are, these are some of the things which you need when you do cover test. Simple, you need a fixation target. Always have a fixation target. You can use a torch, but you should always, when you are going to operate the patient, you have to use a fixation target, both for near and for distance. Use your visual acuity chart and never, uh, you know, never use, uh, never try to, if you are into strabismus or if you actually want to examine a strabismus patient, don't put uh, your uh, visual acuity chart in the corner of your OPD or don't use a mirror which reflects the visual acuity chart at the topmost part, part of your OPD because patient has to look in the primary position. The, the chart has to be at a height of 5 feet from the ground. Because if, if the chart is up, the, the patient is bound to look up and you are measuring up gaze, not primary gaze. Always use fixation, always use fixation target. Near, you have to use accommodative target. This is very important. And you should have prisms to measure the amount of deviation. Okay, uh, that, uh, the, first, the first thing which normally is taught or is talked about is corneal reflection test. So how do you do corneal reflection test? So what you basically do in corneal reflection test is you put a torch, you stand in front of the patient and you see where is the, the, light, uh, the, the, light, uh, the light reflects in terms of the center of the eye or in terms of center of the pupil. So if the light is nasal to the center of the eye, it is exotropia and if it is temporal, the deviation would be esotropia. Now, how do you, how have they calculated this, uh, this uh, theory of uh, one, you know, one millimeter is equal to 7.5 degrees. So, corneal diameter is 12 millimeters and the half would be 6 millimeters. The light reflex at the limbus would be around 45 degrees and therefore the each millimeter of eccentricity amounts to around 7 degrees. This is the theory. So, Hirschberg published this way back in 1885. So how, has, uh, how did he find out that it was 45 degrees? He measured it. He measured that when it is at the limbus, it is 45 degrees. Well, these, these things have been refuted, but we will not talk about that. This is what is given in the books. We will restrict to that. If the reflex is at the pupil, it is approximately equal to this much. 
This is just to give you a gross idea. This never, as Dr. Murli said, never believe in corneal reflection test and operate on corneal reflection test. You have to go ahead and do a cover test. So what, what are the steps of cover test? You first cover the seemingly fixating eye. The response of the non-fixating eye is observed. If the eye moves from out to in, we already discussed that, what happens. So this is, uh, okay, this is uh, one of the patients. I have deliberately slowed down the video four times. So what you do is, on covering the left eye, right eye moves from out to in. So what it is? Simple. You just have to talk, talk about cover test. Don't talk about cover and cover test. What happens? The right eye was out. You covered the left eye. Right eye came in. So right eye was exotropic. Then you move to the second part, which is cover uncover test. You, once the non-fixating eye has taken up the fixation, you have to uncover the seemingly fixating eye which was covered. So what does, uh, what, what would happen? There are only two things which can happen. Either the fixing eye may hold fixation, which means the non-fixing eye has taken up the fixation and would hold the fixation when you uncovered it. This is alternate tropia. And the fixing eye may lose fixation and that is unilateral tropia. The eye may hold fixation but may lose it after a blink or a movement. This is alternate deviation with one of the eye being master eye or there is a mild amblyopia or one of the eyes dominant. Okay, so this... Uh, okay, so this, uh, this video will show us the, the same kid, right eye exotropia on corneal reflection test. So what we have done is, we have covered the left eye. The spinal occluder is being used to show you that uh, you can see the eye under cover also. Uh, so that's the reason why spinal occluder has been used in this particular patient. So right eye takes up the fixation. You left the, you did uncover test and right eye still maintains the fixation. So that is alternate cover test. And then you cover the right eye and then left eye maintains the fixation even after uncover. See, with a blink, he may go for uh, a change of deviation. And when do you do alternate cover test? When none of the eyes is fixing or when both the eyes are fixing. When any one of eyes can be covered and then it is uncovered. Next, the eyes are covered alternatively to break the fusion. Which means that there is no tropia. So what you are doing is, you are trying to break the fusion to find out what happens when you do alternate cover test, you break the fusion. So the fusion, once it is broken, will tell you whether patient has any hidden phoria, whether he has any hidden angle or not. So this tells us about the phoric deviations. So we cover the right eye and then we do alternate cover test. There is a small exophoria. Then we come to prism cover test. What does prism cover test tell you? It tells you the amount of deviation. So how do you measure the amount of deviation. You use prism apex towards the deviation. Alternate cover test is done by putting prisms of higher power to get the maximum deviation. So it is recorded in prism adapters for ESO, base out, exo, base in, hyper base down, hypo base up. And the variants are Krimsky's test and Scobie's occlusion test. We will talk about it later. Okay, this is, a, this is just to show you a prism bar cover test. So what you basically do is you keep prisms of higher power till the deviation is neutralized. So till the point where there is no deviation, that is known as the point of neutralization. And then you move one prism higher, one prism higher to find out the point of reversal. Whether there is a point of reversal at one prism higher or you have to go more compared to, uh, you know, compared to the point of neutralization. The difference between point of neutralization and point of reversal would be the fusional amplitude of that patient. So what you are doing is you are doing alternate cover test. Why? Because you want to find out the maximum amount of deviation. So what does prism cover test tell you? Prism cover test tells you the total deviation, phoric as well as tropic. If you want to find out only tropic deviation, you have to use simultaneous prism cover test. Here you want to, you want to find out the total amount of deviation which includes both the tropic deviation and the, for the hidden deviation. So you are doing alternate cover test. If you feel that the deviation is less than what you, I mean if you feel that near deviation is less compared to distance deviation, you can occlude one of the eye and call the patient again after 45 minutes and then measure the deviation again. That is known as scoby marlowe test and prism cover test should be repeated for near and distance for all the nine gazes. Okay, this we have already seen.
Okay. There is another test which you do uh, in kids or in adult patients where visual acuity is not good. So you can't do alternate curve test when the patient is not able to fix on the target. So if the patient is able to fix on the target with both the eyes, you can do prism cover test. But if one of the eye has poor visual equity, then you can't do prism cover test. So you, you do a Krimsky's test. So there is Krimsky 1, which was originally described by Krimsky, where you have to put prisms in front of the poorly fixating eye or uh, uh, the eye with amblyopic eye or the poor vision eye. And then there is modified Krimsky test where you put prism in front of the better eye, where you put prism in front of the fixing eye sim in, in the similar way like you put it in uh, prism cover test and you keep on increasing the power of prism till you feel that the reflex has come in the center in the non-fixing eye or in the amblyopic eye. So here you, you have to put prism in front of you know, he's, the left eye is not holding the fixation. The kid has a large deviation and he has a high hypermetropic error. So, we have given glasses which reduces the deviation but does not completely obliterate the deviation. Left eye is amblyopic. So, uh, to measure such a deviation, you can do only Krimsky. Remember, this is only, uh, only for the video purpose that we did that. You, we, you are not going to operate the kid because you have to first do amblyopia therapy completely and then take him out of amblyopia and then do um, do the surgery. So what you do is you keep on increasing the prisms in front of the right eye which is base out and then you see whether left eye the corneal reflex is coming in the center or not. Once it comes in the center that is the amount of deviation the kid has. Again this is not a, a very proper test compared to cover test which gives you the total amount of deviation. Nevertheless, this is a useful handy test when, when you want to operate uh, an adult patient with poor fixation in one of the eyes, you can't do alternate cover test and so you have to rely on Krimsky's test. Okay, that brings us to uh, another aspect of, uh, you know, another uh, part of uh, squint examination, ocular movements, ductions, virgins, virgences, you have to find out what are the normal excursions, oblique, devi oblique dysfunction and committant and incommittent deviations. So this is something uh, which we uh, started doing 3-4 years back. So for ocular movements and excursions, we record them in millimeters. So there is a small simple device. So what you have to do is you have to measure the amount of, amount of excursion that is made. So you put it on the limbus and then tell the patient to look on the right, again put it on the nasal limbus to measure abduction and similarly you can do it for adduction. The, the advantage of this particular way of doing it is that you know it is more objective and not uh, like minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4 for, uh, for paralyzed eye or for… Uh, so you can… Uh, this, is, this was one study which we did and these are the normative data uh, compared to what has been published by Kestenbaum in 55. Uh, so, the, okay, this is I think little too, uh, this, this is what was already published by Kestenbaum and uh, uh, we can, just a just couple of videos uh, I would like to show. Just, just few videos, just a four minute video and that would be, we will be summing up Dr. Swami. So these are uh, something which we, these are something. So this was the, the uh, motility tester I was talking about. So there, there are, uh, how do you use it? See this, because we have recorded it, it becomes more difficult, otherwise it is much more simple. But it is uh, like you, you use that scale to measure the amount of adduction, abduction. So a marker is placed on one of the limbus and then you tell the patient to abduct the eye and then move the marker and then from the scale you can find out the amount of uh, movement that the patient made and record it. Uh, this is especially helpful in paralytic cases when you, when you feel that abduction is restricted or adduction in other cases like adduction or elevation is restricted. You can do a follow-up examination and find out uh, whether uh, patient has actually I think somebody doesn't like the presentation. Video. Okay, video is okay. On. Okay, you can see the smaller video. We are uh, we are going ahead. So you can even use this particular thing to measure the uh, lid uh, lid movements uh, or uh, for uh, levator function. You can use this. This is another uh, simple device to measure the uh, chin elevation, chin depression, face turn. 
Uh, we have uh, something which is known as goniometer, but that measures uh, that measures only the face turn. It is difficult to measure chin depression and chin elevation with that. So this is to show you that you know you keep this scale at a one meter distance from the patient and make him wear a headband with a with with a similar pointer that I have in hand. And there's a vision chart. This is my OPD room, and this is our optometrist. So he is the subject here. Uh, so what you do is you can see the pointer coming here and then you tell tell the patient to read it on the chart and if he has a face turn that will be directly uh, from the scale you can see how much face turn he has and then you can move the vertical chart which was here then you can move it here and paste it and then he can have his chin depression also that also you can measure on that. Okay, these are, uh, I did not tell you about the normal way of measuring torsion. These are some, some new things or easy things to, uh, to see torsion. Okay, these are some of the charts or apps which are being prepared for torsion measurement. Okay, this is on a computer. So all the, all the lines are in green and the asterisk is in red. You put a red filter, you can see that the asterisk is gone and only the green lights are seen. Green lines are seen. There's the asterisk here. And then when you put a green, you see that only asterisk is seen and the lines are gone. So when the, when the patient will have some torsion, he will be able to see asterisk moving. And uh, similarly, there are alternate uh, charts available where you have this in red and the line in green. So this is just to tell you how, how you can measure torsion. These are something which, which have come up recently. So you can see only the only the black line, and you. Uh, the important thing to understand here is that you have to neutralize the deviation, vertical and horizontal deviation first before going on uh, and using this. This is uh, this is another uh, stereoacuity app which we have developed, which would be available in smartphone. You can use this to measure near visual acuity and distance visual acuity. The uh, the dissociation. This is the principle. Uh, this is the principle of this particular app. You can uh, measure uh, the amount of stereopsis that the kid has or the, the patient has depending on the distance from the smartphone. You can measure near stereoacuity and distance stereoacuity depending on uh, what is the size of your uh, projector. And uh, another app for uh, measuring fundus torsion. Okay. So measuring torsion on fundus is little difficult and so uh, Okay so once you take a fundus picture normally you have a question how do you measure the disc foveal angle So this is uh, this is something which which is in process we are uh, doing it with uh, so this is a normal fundus picture and here you, what you want to measure is you want to measure the disc foveal angle. So for that you have to define the disc first and then you have to find out the center of the disc. Then you have to draw a line from center of the disc which is straight and another line which comes from center of the fovea to the center of the disc. And that tells you what is the disc foveal angle. This is important when you are measuring patients with torsion. Okay, so the, if you draw a line from center of the fovea, it is a straight line. Here we are drawing a parallel line, which is crossing these two things. The angle would remain the same. Yeah. I think that sums up everything. If there are any questions, please tell me.